Good morning, and welcome to the second session of our series on human capital, productivity, and economic policy. As our main guest today, I'd like to extend a really warm welcome to Professor Costas McGear. And like yesterday, we'll also have Sir Richard Blundell and Professor Stephanie Stanchever with us. Professor McGear is the Douglas A. Warner III Professor of Economics at Yale University. And he has too many affiliations and awards for me to list here. And that basically comes down to the fact that he has a really extensive body of very insightful research. Among countless contributions in, on many fronts, he studied human capital and skill formation from a whole host of different angles. That includes returns to education and training for individuals, firms, and the overall economy, all the way through the life cycle from early childhood to vocational training, higher education, and learning through the, uh, a worker's entire, entire career. He's worked on the role of human capital in driving growth and how it explains patterns in wages over the life cycle, gender gaps, inequality, and mortality. But today we'll be learning about early childhood development, interventions, and mechanisms. I'll also remind you at this point that the chat function has been disabled, but please do ask questions via the Q&A function. During the seminar, we'll just pass on occasional questions of clarification to cost us, but then after the talk itself, we'll have a broader Q&A session during which you can ask essentially anything related to the, the themes of this seminar series. The other thing that I'll note at this point is that the recordings of these uh, webinars will be available, but a few days after the last session. In any case, that's enough from me. Welcome, Professor McGee. Well, uh, thanks very much, Ash. Thanks, everybody, for organizing this, uh, this event. Um, we can't have it in person. It would have been great, but... Uh, but I guess this is the, the next best thing. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about some of this uh, work. Uh, this presentation is going to be really a, a reporting on a, on a body of work rather than a specific paper, um, uh, kind of following the steps of my mentor from yesterday. Uh, and uh, and it's, you know, it's going to, some, some of it's already published, some of it's unpublished, uh, but I'm just trying to and make, um, uh, see what we can make of the of the whole body of work, and it's about early childhood development. As Ash mentioned, this kind of relates, of course, to to skill formation. It relates to the roots of skill formation. You know, when does it start? But this is not so much about uh, measuring these uh, the skills and the returns, but trying to understand uh, how how they are formed, and uh, you know how parents interact with their kids, and how this leads to uh, uh, to to better outcomes that hopefully are sustainable over the life cycle. So uh, just very quickly, I'll flash in front of you a huge amount of names uh, because really, you know, this, is, this relates to work that uh, uh, I've been doing with a lot of people. Uh, headline uh, headline uh, names include Horacio Atanasio, Sally Grantham McGregor, and uh, Marta Rubio Codina. And then depending on what, what uh, part of the work you look at, there are other uh, important uh, co-authors uh, uh, from around the world. There's uh, amazing NGOs like Pratham and, uh, uh, and research centers like SESED in, in India. Uh, you know, they are, uh, they are a huge privilege to work with them. And of course, a ton of funding sources, uh, ESRC, ERC, NIH, World Bank, Dubai Cares and the Coles Foundation at, uh, at Yale, all of which have been very generous in funding much of this work. So let me first of all start with uh, what looks to me like the, the killer graph that says it all. Uh, and you can replicate this in, in a number of counters. This is data from Colombia. And, uh, uh, and, and what does it show? It shows uh, uh, various measures of development, of child development, at, eight, uh, at ages from six months to 42 months. And, uh, and uh, it's split, by, um, it's, it's split by, by basically wealth. Uh, and so the, 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 the top black line are, are the top quartile uh, in, in Bogota and the bottom uh, line are basically the, the lower quartile. I'm hesitating because you know, where exactly they are in the overall distribution depends on, on certain uh, sampling because uh, the top of the distribution is not sampled very well. Okay, so, uh, but, but you get the idea. So when the kids are born, there's already a little bit of a difference. Uh, the difference about, 
you know, 30-35 percent of a standard deviation. Uh, where does that difference come from? Well, we don't exactly know, but uh, a, a likely source, of course, are the uh, are difference in nutrition in utero, and and also, of course, difference in the first six months that we haven't uh, we haven't measured, right? Uh, and uh, but but that's not the story. The story is what hap What you see at 42 months. At 42 months, you see an 80%, a, 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 a 0.8 of a standard deviation difference in, in cognitive development of the uh, high, higher wealth kids to the lower wealth kids. And let me tell you, these higher wealth kids, right, they are you know, solidly lower middle class. You know, uh, I know that from the sampling. We're not talking about rich people here. So, so this, is the, this, this is the key. This is what you need to, to address. You know, you can talk about uh, returns to education, you can talk about equal opportunity, you can talk about funding high schools, but if you don't address this uh, uh, massive gap in the early ages, uh, then uh, you, you're not going to address social inequalities in any fundamental uh, way. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the agenda here, right? The agenda is to understand uh, why and how we get these, how, why we get these gaps and how we can reverse them, and, and, and what does it take to, to reverse them, right? You know, that's the, that's the big policy question. So, uh, I mean, just to uh, tell you what you already know, human capital is the, is the key for escaping poverty and attaining high standards of living. It underlies better wages, improved health, reduced crime, uh, better outcomes for the children of the, of the next generation, uh, and so on. And uh, as I just uh, argued, uh, in deprived communities, kids develop, uh, uh, develop uh, uh, deficits very early on. And this creates an intergenerational cycle of poverty uh, with deficits in human capital at its heart. So uh, the question is what we really know and how can we design effective and sustainable policies? It's quite interesting, uh, during this whole research agenda, I've had the opportunity, I would, uh, uh, not, not necessarily the pleasure, but certainly the opportunity to talk to a lot of governments. And uh, they all seem to, to want uh, free solutions, right? You know, it, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, this is the right group to complain about this a little bit. Uh, you know, you're talking here about what I, what at least I and many others view as the root cause of social inequalities and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, unequal opportunity. And yet many governments uh, see this as something that has to be addressed with uh, the lowest possible resources. And that's sometimes disappointing, but it also sets the agenda for us because we need to find policies that are effective and scalable uh, and, uh, and, can, uh, and can address this, uh, this issue, right? So in other words, one of the constraints is, the, is, is, is our government, uh, our resources. So, uh, the, the, the history of, of child development interventions is, uh, is, uh, is, is long and, uh, uh, and, and brilliant, if you like. We have the Perry Preschool experiment um, in the 60s, uh, whose data has been analyzed by Jim Heckman in great detail. Uh, we have the Abecedarian program in the US, uh, where it involves uh, 111 kids uh, from, uh, uh, from low income families. Uh, and uh, uh, but Campbell is one of the key people there and, uh, and uh, it's been reanalyzed uh, again or new outcomes as adults have been analyzed by Heckman and Conti and, and Campbell uh, herself. And then the, the, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, intervention that we draw on is the Jamaica, Jamaica study of 129 undernourished kids in Kingston, Jamaica. This was designed and implemented by Sally Grantham McGregor who I would say is uh, probably one of the most eminent uh, child development specialists uh, from a medical background in the world. Uh, now, this, this intervention, uh, first of all, is the one that we, we draw from and we build from, uh, but uh, uh, equally importantly, it's been an extremely uh, successful intervention. Let me just take you quickly through that just to, uh, just to see uh, you know, how powerful uh, things can, uh, can, can become if done properly. So this, this experiment, this randomized experiment involved uh, 
four arms, a control arm, and then one arm which had uh, just nutrition, a milk supplement, one that had both, and one that had infant stimulation. Infant stimulation is what we are going to be doing, basically uh, toys uh, uh, and puzzles and so on. I'll go through that. Uh, now, the point is that the only thing that had long-term effects of these, of these three interventions was things that had to do with infant stimulation. Nutrition only had short-term effects, uh, quite surprisingly. But in the long run, you don't see any effect. So here's the, here's the, the really <laughs> important graph. Uh, so the two lower lines, the red and the blue, are the experimental lines. The blue is the control. The red is the treatment uh, that receives stimulation. And on the horizontal axis, you've got the age of the child. And you, you see uh, the first dot, you've got the beginning of the experiment. The second dot is two years later. But at the end of the graph, you've got 18-year-old kids. And actually, if you read later papers, you'll see uh, results on 25-year-old kids. And what do you see there? You see that uh, the initial experiment had an 80% of the standard deviation impact on cognition, uh, uh, which part of it faded away. That's an unfortunate theme in this literature. But half of it remained, and it remained permanently till the age of, uh, uh, till, till, till adulthood, right? So 40% of the standard deviation is a massive change in cognition. Let me just give you an idea from, uh, from numbers that I know uh, that about 25% uh, of difference in cognition for a five-year-old in the United States is equivalent to 7% of earnings as an adult or about a year of schooling. So these are big, big, big effects. Now the blue line are, is the cognitive development of, of poor kids, uh, but not uh, malnourished. So basically, what you, another way of looking at this is that the, uh, the intervention covered half the distance between, uh, between the ultra poor and the normally poor. Okay, uh, now, so one thing I wanted to, uh, to say here is, you know, I think, I think the economists have not really grappled uh, sufficiently yet with, uh, with one important question. And that is, why is it that poor kids develop uh, uh, with deficits? And, and one, you know, economists will, economists will typically, or more traditional economists of my generation, will typically say it's resources, it's money, right? Now, of course it's probably, of course resources have a lot to do with it. But then if it is about resources, if it's only about resources, why are these kids doing so much better with no change in resources? Because basically this intervention is a parenting intervention, right? So the competing view is that this is about beliefs and knowledge. So, you know, in other words, a lot of this literature relies on the idea that uh, for, for reasons that we still don't understand, uh, parents in, in, in lower income settings uh, undervalue the uh, in investments in kids. And these investments can be extremely cheap, like just talking to the child or playing for uh, an hour a day with a, with a child uh, while doing housework. You know, we're not talking about resource heavy uh, interventions. We're talking about uh, relatively uh, cheap uh, interventions. So uh, if you're asking, you know, what's the economic content of all this? Basically, uh, one, another way of, of, of looking at it is we're asking whether uh, giving information and training to parents, does that, uh, does that go some way or all the way towards closing the wealth gap in developmental deficits? And of course, there are people like uh, Greg Duncan who are now carrying out experiments <laughs> where they're actually giving unconditional, uh, unconditional cash transfers to parents to see if that changes the, uh, the development of the children. That's, of course, a very interesting experiment, and I'm planning also to work on this. Uh, but at the moment, uh, the evidence seems to suggest that it's not about uh, resources, but, uh, but it's about uh, knowledge and, and beliefs. Let me just quickly take you through the kind of work we've been, uh, we've been doing and planning to do. So we've uh, run uh, 
two uh, major experiments in Colombia. Uh, one is a home visiting experiment where a home visitor attends the home and, uh, and provides uh, sessions with the parents and the child for one hour a week. Um, and, uh, and this, this you know, we got a benefit of around 26% of the standard deviation only, but quite robust. It was published in the BFJ. And then we did a playgroup uh, experiment again in Colombia using government infrastructure. I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. Effectively, that's taking uh, uh, already existing infrastructure for early childhood development in the government and, and, and improving it by proper curriculum. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and this seems to have been very effective. Uh, I'm going to show you that. Then in India, we've done an experiment in, in urban slums uh, for the normal poor, not the undernourished poor necessarily. Uh, and then we've done a, a large rural experiment, which is a bit like the abecedarian. We did a no to three intervention with uh, either groups or home visits, which I will discuss today, uh, or uh, and followed by another experiment where we re-randomize the kids that, uh, who, who go to, uh, who go to uh, uh, preschools, they all go. Uh, and uh, in half the preschools, we uh, enhance the curriculum, we introduce the, a coach, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, we, we got midline results from that. Unfortunately, we've been prevented from uh, getting endline results from COVID. We're waiting in the wings till uh, COVID disappears from India so we can go and, uh, and get effectively what's going to be a longer term follow up because now, one year later, the intervention has finished a year ago and we still have not been able to collect data. And, and, and this is not only about development, we, we are starting a, a major intervention in New Haven, Bridgeport where uh, our target population will be, uh, 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 will be uh, uh, pregnant, low-income mothers uh, with uh, symptoms of depression. Uh, by the way, if you think that's a small group, it's not. About 50% of low-income uh, pregnant women are depressed. So, you know, it's, a, it, it's kind of a, a major group. Uh, and we're going to start with cognitive behavioral therapy to address depression. Then when the child is born, we're going to do an attachment uh, intervention for the first three months and then for another 12 months we're going to do a uh, child stimulation. Uh, this is funded by uh, a bunch of sources including JPAL, Arnon Foundation, the Tobin Center for Economic Policy at Yale uh, and, uh, um, and, and, the, and the Child Study Center at Yale, the medical school. So it's a kind of a, a major thing and uh, it's, it's, uh, we're setting it up now. It's very exciting and start in um, it's it hopefully in about uh, nine months, 10 months. Okay, so the basic structure, so now I'm going to talk about the basic structure of the intervention and that covers basically everything we do. So the, the emphasis is on designing a program using local resources in a scalable fashion. So even the, the, even the, the US intervention, we're going to use what we call community health ambassadors. In Colombia and in India, we use local women from the villages that we train to deliver our intervention. What's the idea there? The idea is that you do it in such a way that you don't hit a resource constraint, a human resource constraint. So we're not going to, to get uh, you know, PhD students from Michigan to go out and live in, uh, in Indian villages for the rest of their lives to deliver an intervention. Uh, you, you just can't do that, right? That's, uh, that's uh, infeasible and or too expensive. Uh, then we're going to do large scale implementation. So contrary, say, to the original Jamaica intervention, which was very localized in, uh, in, in Kingston, we're going to go all over the country or all, all over the, the district. So again, to, to, to get the flavor of how a scaled up intervention is going to be. Uh, we are going to mimic a scalable delivery. So we, we, we are going to be a bit, we are going to be hands off. So we're going to create a structure very much like the administrative structure that you would create if you were implementing this as a government. Uh, so there's going to be a pyramid structure you know, on the top, it be the researchers, the designers of the thing, and then we're going to have a group of mentors. These mentors are going to uh, be trained at the intervention. They are psychology graduates or social work graduates, and then they are going to go out in the villages. They're going to train the home visitors uh, and the, imp the implementers more generally, uh, and, uh, and the latter are going to deliver it. Okay, so. Um, so, as I said, this is uh, very much. Uh, uh, um, drawing from Sally Graham McGregor's work, uh, including Sue uh, and her team, including Sue Walker, who's now running 
uh, uh, what's called the Reach Up and Learn uh, uh, curriculum in Jamaica from the University of West Indies. Uh, so we are going to promote child development in an integrated manner. What does that mean? We're going to, the intervention is going to address cognitive language, social emotional and motor skills. One thing I'd like to say here, uh, I think this is very well known, but in some sense underappreciated. Language is absolutely key for cognitive development, right? Because the scaffolding on which uh, humans build ideas. So the earlier, the earlier you can get language working, the better you're going to do. And, uh, and when um, uh, here in, in the US, they, they, uh, um, they, 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 they look at word deficits, they find huge linguistic deficits between middle class and working class kids, right? So, uh, and this is hugely correlated with, uh, uh, with outcomes later. So we're going to encourage mothers to teach uh, their children uh, based on uh, events surrounding daily routine activities. You might say, why mothers? Well, you know, our, our job here is not to intervene in the norms, right? We are, uh, uh, you know, we, we accept what's going on, right? And what's going on in a place like India or Colombia is that the mother is, is uh, you know, takes care of the, of, of the kids. We're not going to, you know, it's too much to try and intervene on, on all fronts. Um, we can, uh, we, we're going to involve other kids in the family if they're there and, and so on. And that might generate more spillovers and might reinforce the intervention. So what is the intervention? Uh, I don't know how many of you have kids, probably many of you, uh, and you will not find all this exotic, uh, but that doesn't happen in poor, in poor environments. Uh, they can be picture books, pictures that stimulate conversation, puzzles, uh, blocks and patterns, toys from recycled material, language games and songs. So, uh, and, uh, um, okay, so based on, on, on this principle, we also adapted the intervention to create a new intervention that has not, not been done before, which is the, the play group, right? So in, in some sense, instead of doing home visiting, we're going to actually have an arm in the experiment where the kids all come, uh, come to, with their mother, uh, come to a location once a week in the village where the intervention is delivered to a group. Uh, we designed this because we thought it would be cheaper, indeed it is, uh, but it actually turned up to be a no cost uh, solution, no, no, no uh, trade-off solution. The, the interventions I'll show you uh, delivered in groups did as well, if not better than the intervention uh, delivered at home. And once you think about it, it's not so, uh, so peculiar because basically by, uh, by creating play groups in these rural Indian villages, you're actually promoting the creation of networks of mothers who are often highly isolated. Right, because don't forget that in, in rural India, uh, women uh, who marry typically move to the village uh, of, their, of their husband, which is typically a different village for many good reasons that people like Mark Rosenzweig have uh, studied in detail. So they're quite isolated. So when you put them in groups, not only are you cutting cost of uh, having to send the home visitor in, in the homes uh, separately, but you're actually reinforcing the intervention because you're getting a group of mothers together uh, and that uh, ends up creating better buy-in. But there are other problems that will come to it. Come to it. So uh, in, in Colombia, we did two interventions again. One is a group-based one, the second one, and the first one is a home visiting one. And again, I'm going to talk about them as well. Now, the reason I've put them all together is because the kind of, in, the, the underlying nature of the interventions is similar and the, the kind of results we get across all these is similar. So it's quite instructive to look at them all uh, side by side. Just to get, get you an idea of uh, what uh, the intervention materials look like. Uh, one important thing, of course, you have to do is you have to uh, adapt the, the intervention materials to the local culture. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, the kids have to see in the pictures things that they are not, uh, not totally unfamiliar with, right? There's no point in, uh, in, 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 in putting objects that they do not relate to. Uh, so the top two are kind of uh, pictures and uh, they are actually, they've got a lot of detail there that uh, is very well studied and they are supposed to be, we're supposed to train the mother to then uh, uh, start conversations with her child based on these pictures, right? To show things, to show concepts, items, 
and, uh, and so on. And then there are puzzles, easy puzzles like the shape, like the blue shapes, and harder puzzles like the little girl or the, or the truck. Uh, this is the, uh, an equivalent picture adapted in Colombia. You can have all sorts of uh, discussions there. You can have discussions about uh, the man rushing to catch the bus and being late. You can have uh, discussions about the fruit and the, uh, and the, and the merchandise on the top and, and, and so on travel, etc. And these are, these are toys that we teach mothers to make from recycled materials that we have surveyed that exists in the homes. So we go to the villages, we find what kind of uh, recycled material exists, and then we, we, uh, we demonstrate how you can make toys. The toys don't look like anything, uh, but the kids love them, right? And they, are, and they, and they serve certain functions. Uh, and, um, uh, and basically, it costs nothing to do this. It costs very, very little amount of time. And that's, that's the point, that's the question. You know, when I come down in my other hat as a, an economist that does structural models, and I think about how to uh, model the decisions of parents to, uh, uh, to uh, invest in their kids, I have huge difficulty because I'm not sure what should be going in the budget constraint, right? You know, and it's not clear to me that buying a Calvin Klein t-shirt, which is 10 times as expensive as a normal t-shirt, uh, would, uh, would uh, improve the development of my child. And yet a, a, wealthy, a wealthy family will record much, much more expenditure on their kids than a, than a lower income family. But much of that expenditure might not reflect anything that's developmentally interesting. At least um, one can speculate. And this is what we want mothers to achieve. This is, this is, these are toys made by a mother of the intervention. Of course, she's one of the, you know, the most successful cases. Uh, that's, that's in India. You can see an elephant. You can see, uh, a, 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 let's say, I guess, a, a donkey on the right hand side. Uh, that's all made from just cloth, pieces of string, and styrofoam. So the intervention design, uh, we have uh, 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 the mentors, our college graduates. Uh, they, uh, some, some kind kind of relevant degree, not anything very specific. The home visitors are women from the local community, literally the villagers themselves, who are trained uh, by the mentors. Uh, in, in Colombia, we kind of use the, the local uh, conditional cash transfer program uh, because the, w w women who represent the villages are, are, uh, are elected out of, uh, uh, are, are beneficiaries themselves. And so we, but of course they are kind of respected and uh, and, uh, and broadly accepted, so we, we recruited them. Okay, in India, these are community workers of, our, uh, of, the, of the NGO that we collaborate with, Pratham. Uh, and uh, local women are very important because first of all, they are available. Secondly, uh, they are well connected. So they are uh, best placed to promote ideas of child development that may be alien to many of these uh, uh, cultural contexts. Uh, and uh, yeah, so these, uh, these are the key reasons. Um, <clears throat> okay, so each home visitor visits the household once a week. This is the home visiting intervention. The session be begins with a review of activities from the previous week. In other words, the home visitor asks the mother uh, uh, to, to, uh, to perform the set of activities with her child in front of her to just make sure that they're doing them, right? The puzzle, the song, the, the game of looking for things, uh, word games and so on. Once that's done, the materials, uh, uh, she, she takes away the materials from the previous week. So there's no subsidy element in the intervention, even if these materials are very cheap. In other words, we're not leaving puzzles, we're not leaving toys for more than a week, right? We're taking them away, and then she introduces the new set of materials and activities. She shows them one by one to the mother and the child how to play with them. And then she encourages her to do it during the, the week, and also to introduce such activities during housework, when, uh, when, they, when cooking is taking place, to talk to the child, uh, tell her what she's doing, and so on and so forth. The intervention lasts between 18 months and 24 months, 
depending on the context, uh, the, the, the fine print there is depending on the funding. So we, we like it to last two years. The, this, this picture shows you the essence of what's going on here. The lady in purple is the home visitor. Uh, the, the, the lady, in, let's call it red, uh, is the mother. And of course, you recognize the child. And you can see the, the mother is really addressing herself to the, uh, the, the home visitor is addressing herself to the mother, and the mother is playing with the child. So it's a parenting intervention. It's not the home visitor coming in once a week, playing with the child and going away. It is training the mother to do it, right? And uh, to, in other words, what to do to, to be very rewarding, to, uh, to, to help, but not to do the puzzle herself, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to encourage the child, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, Klausus, we have a clarifying question. Um, yeah. So someone in the audience has asked, you know, how difficult is it to monitor these interventions? Because you want this hands-off method, but to some degree there has to be monitoring and to also ensure randomization in the chosen sample. Oh, randomization. Well, you know, we, we randomize at the village level. So, uh, so, so that, that's, not, that's not an issue. Uh, and we have uh, in, the, in these interventions very little non-compliance. And indeed the, the mothers are, well, actually that's not completely true. I will, I, will, I will go through that. But the randomization at the village level to avoid these spillovers if, uh, if that's the subtext here. Uh, the, uh, the monitoring well, you know, first of all, that's, that's the point of a scalable intervention. Uh, effectively, the mentors are supposed to be monitoring, right? Uh, and, uh, and collect data on implementation. But that's a really important question, you know, because it, it, you know, it's, it's, all in the, it's all in the ability to really implement this. Now, we, you know, we have quite good implementation data and it looks as if it is, it is being, uh, uh, you know, it is being followed. So uh, I'm quite optimistic, but I'll show you some numbers later. Now, in Odisha, the, the, the whole thing, uh, the, the, second, uh, the second intervention, uh, first intervention is home visits, the second is play groups. So eight mothers and their child will attend once a week. So uh, the play groups, um, uh, well, I talked about it. So that's how it looks like, more or less. Uh, the, the lady in, in light blue is the facilitator. Uh, you can't see them very clearly, but there are various plastic toys at the, uh, uh, and, and she has to uh, give activities to mothers and child, depending on the age of the child because even there, there's some variability of about up to a year. So, uh, so, so that's, that's the, the difficulty, that's the possible dilution. But then again, you create this group of, of people who get together once a week, they form friendships, and that could reinforce the intervention. As you can see, the environments are not particularly plush. This is you know, kind of a derelict building uh, that we found, scarcely a roof. Uh, so this is a very, very low resource intervention. Right. This is not something, you're not requiring things to happen at a, an extremely expensive level. Uh, we also did nutrition education. I will not talk too much about that because this gave a, a very, didn't give any, any uh, real outcomes on cognition. It did change the diet, but without any discernible effects in the short run. So uh, evaluation design, as the question was raised, all our, our interventions are, are uh, uh, we use a cluster randomized controlled trial. Uh, uh, so we use clustering to avoid spillovers. We collect data from all children, even if they drop out to avoid any bias, uh, unless they migrate, but that's a very low rate. Uh, and we have negligible attrition. So what I said before, so we, we, we don't have a problem of, of bias in the data. We do have a problem, uh, particularly with the groups of, of non-compliance, but I'll show you the figures later. Here, I'm going to show you uh, some characteristics of the population we are, we are talking about. Uh, for example, in, uh, this is, these are the slums of Katak. This is one of the two Indian experiments. Uh, as you can see from the highlighted uh, blue uh, line, the Z score of height is minus 1.1. Uh, that's about uh, left tail 13 uh, percent. In a, if the population was normal, uh, that should have been zero, right? So, so this is a relatively 
malnourished, but not chosen to be malnourished population, just chosen to be poor. The mothers have about seven years of education. Uh, we have some random imbalance. Uh, if you look at whether these imbalances are jointly significant, they are not. So you can see this on the step down p values on the right hand side. Uh, in this small experiment, we have 54 slums, 27 treatment, and 27 control. For all our inference, uh, to avoid data mining, we're going to use the Romano Wolf step down uh, p values. We're going to separate the hypothesis in groups, primary outcomes and secondary outcomes. And then we're going to jointly test them and adjust the p-values for what we call what's called the family-wise error rate. Costas, uh, sorry, I have a clarifying uh, question. I, I'm not able to use the QA probably yeah. because I'm a panelist, so I'm just can you comment on the work behavior of these mothers? Are these all stay-at-home mothers? Uh, mostly yes. Uh, no, no, less in Colombia. Uh, than, uh, than in India. Uh, some work, some work in their own field, uh, but generally female participation in India is very low. Thank you. So here are some outcomes. These are the, uh, the left two columns relate to, uh, to urban slums of, of, of Odisha in India. The right two columns relate to uh, small towns in Colombia. The right two columns are our first experiment. The left two columns are our are, uh, uh, are, are first experiment in India. So in India, we're getting 36% of a standard deviation in cognition, which is uh, quite good, not as good as we would have liked. Uh, I remind you that uh, Sally in Jamaica already got kind of 80%, which is of course stellar. Uh, but this is, you know, this is, uh, we're clearly affecting things. Uh, we now have evidence that this is sustainable, uh, but we've not published that yet. We have a, a, an improvement in language, a receptive language. That, that receptive means the child understanding what you're telling them. Expressive language is the child being able to, to express, uh, uh, you, know, you show them an apple and they can, uh, and they can say the word. Um, and, uh, and we're getting a, a benefit there. In Colombia, we also get a benefit in cognition, smaller, about 26% of the standard deviation, which if you sustain it, it's a big, big effect. It's like one, at least one year of schooling in the US, right? Let's not uh, 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 underestimate that. And we're getting a benefit in language as well. As you can see, these effects are highly significant. Individually, the p-values are zero, right? Uh, at this point, you know, we're getting a 1.6 p-value uh, because of course we've adjusted that for multiple testing. So there's no, you know, there's, in other words, there's no data mining here. There's no uh, kind of, we're not, we're not fooling you here by testing tons of stuff and, uh, and showing you what's significant. All, everything's adjusted for multiple testing, which of course I think is, is part of paramount importance when you're running experiments, right? We get no effects on motor. Uh, and if you, do, if you look at the factor index, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, an overall uh, principal component, we get about 31% of a standard deviation improvement, uh, which is quite substantial. Now, who benefits? This is a bit more speculative, uh, but if you look at this table, you know, I'm getting, I'm running out of time, but if you look at these tables, you'll see that uh, we get a massive effect on boys of 51% of a standard deviation for language and 45% for cognition, right? but we get very low effect for girls, right? Uh, and insignificant. And the reason I highlighted a receptive language because uh, that difference between boys and girls there is actually significant at the 4%. Uh, again, everything's adjusted for, for multiple testing. Uh, uh, so uh, so all, the, all these hypotheses are, are jointly tested. Then if you do a different break, a different cut by mother's education, which is already very low, but uh, for the lowest of the low, <coughs> we're not getting a benefit. But for, the, but for the mothers that have kind of completed elementary school, we get a little bit more, we're getting a, a much higher benefit of about 37% uh, of a standard deviation. 
that's only marginally significant. I don't know, different, but uh, but you know, there's there's a question there. Uh, you know, we, uh, what, one of the things we've been asking ourselves is, you know, uh, are we getting at the lowest of the low, or are we getting at the slightly more disadvantaged poor? Okay, this is suggestive evidence. Uh, in the uh, you know the, I wouldn't say that. Uh, you know, these p-values are strong enough to be able for us to say, you know, with certainty that we've discovered something, uh, but uh, it's a little bit worrying that we're only having an effect on boys, although if you want to see the silver lining, the effect on boys is massive. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's another more optimistic way of, of looking at it. Now, this is our, our very large rural experiment in Odisha. This includes, I've not said that yet, 192 communities spread out over uh, two districts uh, in, uh, in Odisha. Uh, one of the districts, Bolangir, is uh, uh, three districts actually. Uh, one of the districts is kind of very remote um, and, uh, and uh, quite close to the uh, to areas that are uh, dangerous and, and and the others are a bit closer to urban centers. Uh, and what we get here now, here is that th this is really striking. You just focus on the highlighted uh, things. We're getting the same effects. So the top panel is the midline. That's after one year of intervention. The lower panel is end line. That's after two years of intervention. Two things strike you here. First of all, the groups which is the second, the middle panel, uh, give you the same effect as the home visits, which is the lower panel. And one could argue even better. So we've slashed the cost, I'll show you, to by a, a quarter, and we get the same effect. And this is true also if you go to end line. At end line, look the 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 the, the, the p-values that, that are adjusted are the the ones in the last column, as you can see, they're very, very low, right? Super significant effects. There's no doubt that these are important and, and extremely significant effects. And there are no different between the groups and the, and the home visits. That's extremely promising, right? Because, <coughs> because the cost is only a fraction. Uh, finally, we did another intervention. And this is interesting for two reasons. It's a much shorter intervention, just 10 months. And it addresses kids basically that are newborn. So this is earlier than the previous one. The previous intervention, <coughs> the youngest kids here were seven months, seven to 16 months at the start. And in this intervention, they were one year old at the start. This intervention is from birth, right? Secondly, so, and we, we gave a large nutritional supplement there. Now look, as economists, you should be jumping up and down and saying, oh, this supplement is going to be uh, crowded out. So it's a very important question to see if the supplement has an effect, right? Because as economists, we think that all these interventions should be crowding out things that parents do. They don't, that's, you know, that's the big puzzle. Well, it's not perhaps a big puzzle because there may be non-convexities, right? So perhaps, you know, Parents will, uh, you know, it's a bit like you know, you've got a kid, you're poor, and the kid can't go to college because college costs, I don't know, 15,000 a year or something like that. Uh, but then uh, the government gives you a $10,000 subsidy. At that point, the parents might decide, okay, fine, I'll top it up with another 5,000. That's a non convexity, right? So, so things like that may be happening here. So we get a 16% of a standard deviation improvement in cognition. Uh, for these kids, right? The, the Bailey uh, is the most comprehensive test. We, we had declared other primary outcomes, so we report them. It doesn't seem as, as if we're getting a height effect, but actually we will, we do, because uh, th that's actually very important. So let me look at this. We break down height in percentiles below, uh, so minus one standard deviation to minus five standard deviations uh, height, uh, middle, minus one standard deviation to plus one standard deviation, and top tail, one to five. 
Again, no trickery here. We've, we've done all the multiple uh, 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 testing adjustments. So you can see there is uh, 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 about six percentage point reduction in the, proportion, in, the, in, the, in the proportion of kids that are below one standard deviation of height from the median. And that's significant at 10%. And where does it go? It goes to the middle. In the middle group, we have a 6.8% increase, uh, which, is, uh, which is significant at the 5% level, right? So we are, affecting, we are affecting height as well. And why do we care about height? Well, height is a nutritional indicator. Right? And, 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 and I think what we're learning here is that if you want to affect nutritional status, <coughs> you have to start very early. And this is not only our study that shows this, many studies show this. Now, the other interventions were in some sense too late to affect, uh, to affect nutritional status in a fundamental way. <coughs> uh, just very quickly, because that's important for scaling up. Uh, the, the top table here gives you <coughs> compliance results for rural Odisha. So the second uh, uh, column, which is group stimulation uh, plus nutrition education, we have a 75% compliance rate. Uh, while the home visit, which is individual stimulation, IS, the next column, we have uh, an 86% compliance rate. But that's not all the story. The important story is unfortunately here, right? And the number of sessions at, at, uh, attended by the group stimulation are towards the low side. That's the second column. While the individual stimulation number of sessions is towards the high side. But that makes the results even more surprising. If you think of it in terms of treatment under treated, the group stimulation effect is having a much larger effect on outcomes than the home visits. Of course, from a scaling up point of view, you want to address attendance. You know, if you're doing an intervention like this, it's no good to have people attending just 50% of the sessions, right? Uh, but on the other hand, from a, is this effective? It's massively effective. I'll just, sorry to interrupt, but when you look at these attendance patterns, it seems like, you know, the group play group might be, you know, take more individual volition to attend. Do you think there's selection as to who is not attending each of these interventions in terms of resources? Well, sure there is. Yeah. I'm sure there is kind of, you know, because there's a distance to, to get there. And uh, uh, yeah, there is. Of course, there's no bias because we follow old kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but, uh, but yes, they, I'm, I'm sure there is. We haven't managed to really analyze that, but it's, it's uh, you know, if you think of it in terms of a local average treatment effect, kind of thing, you know, you're, you're clearly, you're clearly talking about uh, a particular, a particular group and whether that group is the, the one that most benefits or whether the one that drops out would have benefited more, that's another uh, important question, right? So it goes back to the question of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, are we getting to the poorest of the poor or the middle poor, if you like? Although I can tell you, when you visit these villages, uh, you know poverty is uh, is is striking everywhere. Now I want to spend ten time ten minutes to speak about a little bit about mechanisms. Okay, so let me tell you first of all the bottom line. We've done a lot of work on this, both in a very simple uh, way, which is uh, kind of looking at what parents do, and a more structural way. Uh, like in our AR paper with uh, uh, Orazio and Sarah Catan and, uh, uh, and others, Marta Rubio Codina, Emla Fitzsimmons. And, uh, uh, and uh, what we find is that it works through changing the investment behavior of the parents. I example. Here, for example, let's look at, at, uh, at uh, tell stories. Half the control group tells stories to their kids, self-report. Now, when you look at the intervention group, this goes up by 13 percentage points in the individual stimulation and 8 percentage points in the group stimulation. Look at the singing. 
Uh, there it goes up in all intervention groups quite a lot, but it's much lower in the control group. Go out, everybody goes out. Play with toys. It, uh, it's only 27% in the control group. It kind of goes massively up relative to the baseline in the two, inter in the two important stimulation intervention groups, individual stimulation and group stimulation. Okay, so you see changes in, in parental behavior. Draw, paint, etc. only 40% in the control group, much larger in the treatment group. Right? So you're changing the behavior of the parents in the dimension that you want. Okay. Uh, then if you look at, this is a different experiment, Katak, right? What are you doing there? You're changing the quality of the home environment. That is an index of all these activities, everything that happens in the home, massively. 30% of the standard deviation, whatever that means, an index, of course. You're reducing maternal depression, right? By measured by the CESD 10, by 21% of the 22% of the standard deviation, right? So you are changing things with the parents. And that's the, that's the key to understand this. Now, let me talk about the cost. I just want to show you the, the cost here. Look at the one I'm highlighting. In Odisha, it costs $135 per year per child for the home visits. That's not a lot of money. I mean, it is relative to the Indian GDP, which is about $1,700, right? Uh, but of course, you'll only be doing it for a fraction of the kids. But look at the, at the group sessions. They only cost $38 per child uh, 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 per year, right? So, you know, that should be considered cheap by all accounts, particularly because you've got massive effects. Now, uh, so let me, so what we do next, I guess I've got what, eight minutes? Well, how much, how, do I, how long do I have? Yeah. What do we yeah, do? Yeah, about next? 10 minutes. Yeah, we take, we take this data and we wear a different hat, we, we become, uh, kind of modeling economists. I don't know if it's called structure or not. And we estimate uh, investment equations by parents and production functions to understand the, the, the creation of, a, of a human capital. Now, we have expressly stayed away from a choice model. Right? We are not modeling parental choices in an explicit way with a budget constraint, exactly because <clears throat> we are not convinced that the parents know the production function, right? And that's, you know, and if you write down a choice model, you'll have to have the parents optimizing uh, their, um, uh, you know, their child's uh, either utility or human capital, whatever, you know, either altruistic or they just care about human capital or whatever, or it's the same thing, I'm not sure, subject to something. And the two somethings are the budget constraint and the, and the human capital production function. Right. Unfortunately, we do not know what goes in the budget constraint because the kind of stuff we've been talking about are extremely cheap. It's about, uh, it's about doing things like talking to your child and occasionally playing. It's not about staying at home from work uh, uh, these, uh, 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 and, uh, or reducing your work effort. Actually, we looked at labor supply and for the few women and for the women who do uh, in, in Colombia, and, and we had no effect on labor supply, despite the fact we had an effect on, on, on children. So we do not know what goes in the budget constraint and we do not know what goes in the, uh, what production function the parents think. This, this work by Flavio Cunha, who shows that uh, uh, mothers in Pennsylvania uh, are not aware of the production function and that's before they have children. So, so what we do is we, uh, we take a, a factor analytic approach, very much like uh, drawing from Cunha Heckman and Cunha Heckman and Schenach, that's, that's our, our source. <clears throat> we estimate a factor model uh, where we put all our measures of cognition, child cognition, parental cognition, investment measures, and we, and we, uh, and we extract factors from that for child cognition, for parental uh, uh, cognition, and for investments, right? Just to show you an idea here. So for example, the Bailey, which is the flagship test that we're using uh, has a signal to noise ratio of about 75%. Uh, then we have these 
measures for socio-emotional skills, right? Uh, some of them are, uh, you know, are, are, are have very high signal, others, others less. But anyway, these are show you kind of the, the inputs that go into our, uh, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in the detail, this bit is, is actually published in the AER uh, uh, last year um, and uh, last January, yeah. So we estimate these kinds of equations. These equations are reduced form equations for investment. So basically regressing investment on, 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 on baseline child cognition, baseline socio-emotional skills, parental cognition, parental socio-emotional skills, and demographic composition. And then we estimate a production function and we allow for these investments to be endogenous. And the point is that we're allowing the treatment to affect investments and the treatment to affect the production function. And we do a horse race between direct impact of treatment on child outcomes vis-a-vis -vis indirect, uh, uh, indirect uh, uh, impact uh, through what it does to investment, right? This tau subscript is treatment status. So let me show you here some results. Because I, I, I think uh, these are the, the sources of, uh, of social inequalities at the beginning. First of all, th these, are, these, are, uh, these are investments in materials and in, in, in kind of time. It's not exactly time, it's, um, it's activities. So what you see is the treatment indeed improves investments. So despite the fact that it's a transfer in kind, you don't seem to have crowding out, you have crowding in. Okay, so parents, as a result of the intervention, do more. And they do a lot more. But look at the other thing. First of all, high cognitive mothers invest more in their kids, much more. Even conditional on the child cognitive skills. So a child born in a, in a household where parents have high levels of, of human capital are going to get more investment, whatever, right? Now, whether that's resources or whether that's better knowledge, we are not taking a line here. Prices matter, I'm not going to go through that. There are instruments, I'm not, I don't have time to go through that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, Becker is alive and well, uh, number of children reduce investments. So uh, larger families, each child gets less. But good news, many children are good for cognition. That comes out in some other, in the production function. So many children reduce parental investments, but they help each other in, uh, in developing cognition. It comes out in some results, okay? Um, okay, so then we use this in the production function. Now, I was ambitious. I was going to go through this whole table, but let's forget about it. And let's just look at the, at, the tape, at the column four. Column four, you see that the investment impact is very large. This is a Cobb Douglas production function, is very large on child outcomes, on child cognition. And the treatment effect, the treatment has no direct effect. Okay, it all comes through investment. Now we know the treatment affected cognition. There's no doubt about that. That's the reduced form results I showed you in the experiment. But it, but, but it does so through parental investments. That's the key. Now, because I don't have time, and because I think this is an important result, I'm going to show you this coming up in the other experiment as well. In, uh, in, uh, in the Colombian, uh, in, in the Colombian uh, playgroup experiment. Again, the treatment there affects investment about the same amount, 30% of a standard deviation. It doesn't affect knowledge of maternal knowledge. It doesn't affect self-efficacy. It doesn't affect even uh, food, food insecurity, although it does reduce it a bit through the nutrition, but certainly affects parental investment. Then when you go to uh, exactly the same type of table I just showed you, just uh, focus on, uh, on, the, on, on, on this column here. 
you will see that parental investment, again, eliminates the treatment effect. Here's the treatment effect you get when you don't put parental investments in there. When you put parental investments and you use instrumental variables, uh, then the, the direct treatment effect disappears and what's acting here is parental investments. So basically, and these, these investments are not big expenditure items. I have to repeat that. It's about you know, whether they talk to their kids, whether they read books to them, uh, whether they uh, uh, take them on outings and, and th things like that. Now, these are not intensive stuff, right? So, you know, I don't have any, any time left. So I'll just, uh, uh, I'll just conclude by saying that early childhood is a critical period for the development of human capital. We do not clearly understand the obstacles to developmental deficits, although they are intimately linked to, to poverty. Cheap interventions that address parent parenting are capable of changing children's developmental trajectories, although their impact can vary depending on population and details of implementation. So that, in other words, the devil is in the detail. All our work seems to suggest that the principal channel by which these interventions operate is by altering parental behavior, investments, behavior, call it what you want. The key to sustaining impact is, is to sustain this change in parental behavior. And the extent to which resources matter uh, and the way they may do is a key research question. So this is what I had to say for today and uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Costas. That was um, absolutely fascinating and clearly a set of very important results. So before we move to uh, questions, of course, people can write questions at any time in the Q&A session. I'm gonna move on to the two brief discussions by other, other guests. So Stephanie, um, are you ready to, to start off? Sure, um, absolutely. Great, uh, thank you, Costas. This is absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's uh, probably, it's hard to overstate the importance of this, of this work, given that every such intervention, if it's bad, it can have terrible consequences. If it's good, it can have amazing consequences. So it's, uh, it's obviously an incredibly important, incredibly important research agenda. And I'm incredibly happy that it's, you know, incredible researchers like you tackling this. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, I, I definitely want to be mindful of leaving also the time for the, for the audience, because um, it's always great to have a discussion. I was very curious about three things, um, you know, based on your, based on your experience here and with your other projects, and maybe also from your co-authors. The first thing is that it seems a quite recurrent pattern, even at later ages, that there's such different effects for boys and girls. And I'm wondering to what extent you think that's actually a country specific thing, but I, I, I was under the impression I've seen also some things for the US. Um, so is that something that you think is generally the case and um, what, what could be done to mitigate or basically increase the impact for, for girls? Um, the second big question I had is, it seems like the effects, and you said that you've shown that the effects can be sustained even though you may not constantly re-intervene. Um, and so I'm wondering what, what is embedded in the intervention or what you would recommend embedding in these interventions to actually have the effect be longer, longer lasting um, and whether this is actually something that should be done recurrently, for instance, every, every few years again as the child ages and has different needs, someone comes in again with a different set of you know, mentoring and activities. And then the third question I had is whether you've extracted some general patterns that may not be that culturally specific, uh, that actually are, you know, you think broadly applicable and broadly, uh, broadly there, or whether your view is actually that this is incredibly sort of locally, culturally specific, and we should not, you know, we shouldn't try to generalize it. This should actually be done very much case by case in a tailored way. So I'm curious on about these three, these three big questions. Ash, now or later? Um, how about we get Richard to, to give his brief discussion, then you can respond uh, all together in case there's overlap. 
Yeah, okay, there's some overlap too. So thanks, Costa, it's, it's really good. Uh, I've seen this uh, developing from the very early work. It's amazing work and very important. Um, and I like the way now, you know, in some sense, moving away from resources, it would still be quite interesting to see the horse race, as you mentioned, the Greg Dungan experiment maybe, but um, looking at resources versus, um, versus uh, these uh, interventions, although these are very low resource interventions. Um, I just had a couple of thoughts on thinking about um, these, uh, first the parental interventions and whether, I think you you answered some of this, but I, as I was reading, I was thinking, you know, there's the first case of, well, is it the parents or mothers don't realize the importance of early years intervention? They just don't realize that. That was one thought people had, certainly I remember on the US interventions where, uh, you know, talking to the kids was very important, but the parents could have done that. They just didn't realize it would have any impact because their comment was, well, the kids don't speak. Uh, so how could it be important? And I remember that happening, I think actually in the Perry School react kind of response. Um, so that's that's one thing, and that's that's about information, of course. Uh, the the other is that the parents do understand, but they don't have the kind of know how of what to do. So they they do realize it, but they just don't you know they they just don't realize what words to choose, how to talk to the kids, those kind of things. So it's about uh, about uh, know know how, and then uh, of course there's the last thing which they just don't have. It's not know-how really, it's it's the, the whole skill set. And uh, going through the results, it's, you know, mother's education does really matter here. So the skill set of the mother does does seem uh, very important. I, I guess it's all these three that are going on, but it it seems uh, it seems quite quite important in the way these are thought of and roll, rolled out. Uh, for example, with the monitor, you know, the monitor person could be someone who's just there, you know, to check up things are going going right, which is a very cheap thing to do. It's a bit like, you know, why open office works, you know, people are monitoring each other. Um, and uh, uh, or it could be they're learning from the monitor, you know, they're teaching the parent or they could be teaching the child. Uh, I think you've persuaded us that it's not teaching the child directly it's either teaching the mother or monitoring the mother and uh, I thought that you know digging into that and maybe you've got something here on what's uh, going on on there you a couple of th these long-term effects seem very important especially given you know you've probably seen the work on you know, the disappointing works from all the, the nudge and information experiments that are now turning out. I'm thinking of, uh, of not these particular ones, but you know, the very famous nudge experiments don't seem, to, they work for a while, but they've really, you know, people's behavior changed, but it goes back very, very easily. And so it's a bit like Stephanie's point that, um, you know, when the, when the monitor's gone <laughs> and pe you know, people back in their usual village uh, organization they just revert this this is, turns out to happen with saving behavior from the nudge experiments which is a little disappointing i i i i think there so that there's a few things about um the mechanism uh, there on the boys and girls i also wanted to get into that do, do you know whether it's something going on with the interaction with boys and girls is it that you know after all we do think that some some uh, cultures do prefer investments in boys uh, for various reasons. And uh, is there any signal on that? I guess you could you could look at what's going on in these interventions. If there are a boy and a girl in the same intervention, or mainly girls or mainly boys, to see whether you know is the is the attention going on the boys as we think it it often is in uh, in those kinds of kinds of experiments. Um, uh, and then lastly, but I think you solved it because uh, early on you said the nutritional experiments were having no, look, very little impact. And I thought, wow, that's very different from what I remember Jerry Berman and others uh, coming up with that, that it had a big effect, especially on, on stunting, which was very important. But I think your answer there was you have to get in really early with the uh, nutritional 
interventions and uh, that that if you get in uh, a little bit later that that's um, that that's that's a that's a that's a problem oh well there's lots of other things it's uh, it, it's really good but there's a few thoughts thanks well thanks thanks both uh, really important questions here first of all let me let me start with one of the common things that you both said about sustainability first of all our first our first experiment in Colombia, uh, the effects were not sustained. Right? We've published that. Uh, and interestingly, neither was the parental behavior. <laughs> Call it a coincidence, but you know, parental behavior reverted to the control group. Now, uh, Sally's experiment in Jamaica, half the effect was lost, but half of 80 is still a lot. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, so. My reaction to that was, let's go and, and, and do what Stephanie said, which was exactly what we did. Let's continue the intervention till school. So in India, we, I mean, this is one of my, I hope it doesn't end up being one of my biggest disappointments in my life, but uh, uh, you know, we re-randomized these kids, right? The, the, the kids in Odisha, the 192 communities, we re-randomized them half into an enhanced preschool and half into status quo preschool, right? Uh, and, uh, and we did complete that intervention and, uh, and we have midline data of that intervention, which is very promising because the treatment group is not fading out at all. And that was even at the beginning, Mid midline was, you know, things had not operated that well. And then the intervention was going really well. I, you know, I did a field visit there. It was fantastic. It was really, you know, quite impressive. Uh, and then COVID struck, literally uh, a month after after my field visit, and we're not able to collect endline data on that. But that's also what what Abecedarian did. Abecedarian carried out the intervention all the way to twelve. But we know that the impacts happened up to about five years old. And, and yes, uh, uh, Stephanie, I think, and everybody else, I think the, the point is that this, there might be the following trade-off. You either do a very small, very um, focused efficacy trial like the Jamaica intervention, and then you get these huge effects that are sustainable. Or, or if you're going to do something that's much more scalable with local resources and so on, and uh, less, more hands-off, then you might have to do it over a longer period of time. And, and in my view, it cannot be that the answer is that you go for the first two years and you do something and then you abandon the kids uh, uh, and wait for them to become, uh, you know, if you think of it in terms of policy, not just in terms of research, in terms of policy, you, you'd want a human capital policy that starts at birth, right? And offers, you know, high quality stimulation of kids all the way to school. And then, then you want high qu good quality schools and so on. I think the answer, you know, I don't, I don't want to put it, is it early or is it late? I think it's, they're complementary and they are both. If you do well early, you're going to do better late. I think we have evidence on that. We have observational evidence on that for sure, right? Uh, and I was trying, you know, we were trying to, to create, um, uh, or we are trying to create uh, experimental evidence to show that this complementarity exists. Uh, and uh, I, hopefully, I just hope that, you know, the intervention, the, the COVID just goes away the next few months in India, and we're able to to go and, and and collect our data and demonstrate. But the midline is very promising. Now, boys versus girls. Wow, you are asking difficult questions here. Um, you know, to be honest, at this point, I think you need to do a big powered up experiment that will uh, allow you to look at these things. Now, of course, we've done everything that uh, you would have done as well. We've looked at time use. It doesn't look any different. But you know, I, I believe that the treatment of boys and treatment of girls. The differences are very, very subtle. You know, you can be spending the same time, amount of time with, with girls and boys, but saying different things to them, doing different things. And, you know, the, the, the standard survey data is not going to, to capture that, right? Now, uh, is, it, is it general? Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I have to say that in Colombia, we didn't find anything. Uh, but again, you know, we had 96 communities. Don't forget, these are class of trials. So the, the power works at the cluster level. Uh, at least in India, we have 192 communities. Well, 
yeah, so in the big experiment, we didn't see it, but we saw it in the small experiment. So I think, you know, I think the, I think the, the jury's out there as what, what's going out, what's going on, if it's noise or if it's uh, something happening. If you look at the substantive data we collected, even, even in India, it doesn't look at that level that parents are, are doing very different things with girls. It does look that girls are more advanced than boys in the early on, so, but it's not super significant. In other words, the baseline measures of girls are higher than the baseline measures of, of boys. So perhaps boys are playing catch up, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's, it's different. Now, um, resources versus, uh, versus interventions. Let me say that poverty matters. And you know, we all know, I, I think, Cindy uh, Mulley Nathan's work on, on poverty and, res sorry, and, and resources matter. And perhaps resources matter because they alleviate anxiety and, uh, and make life a bit easier. And then you can concentrate and think about, of your kids. You know? So resources can matter in, in many different ways. They don't have to matter in terms, oh, I don't have the money to buy this Fisher Price toy and hence my child is going to not be able to go to MIT or Harvard to, to get an education. Uh, it, it, it might be that, oh my God, my, you know, my mind is occupied with, with surviving and of course I can't take care of my kids. So I don't, I don't want to say the resources don't matter, but the way they matter may be very, very subtle, and not, in, not in the traditional budget constraint kind of, uh, uh, of way. I think that's a very serious proposition that we, we have to think about. And I think the experiment that looks at the role of resources uh, and intervention and the complementarity might be very important. Uh, do the parents, uh, well, you know, do they uh, know, uh, uh, do they know that early intervention, early investments matter and do not know what to do vis-a-vis um, they don't know that, you know, I'm not completely sure there's a fundamental difference between these two things. Now, in terms of the home visitor, you know, I don't want to call her a monitor. I mean, that's exactly what we really don't want to call them, right? Because uh, interventionally, we wanted, we, we instructed these people to build relationships with the mothers, right? And relationships of trust, not relationships of, uh, of hierarchy. Indeed, this was one of the hardest things to coach, uh, highly stratified societies uh, where caste matters and, and all sorts of things. Um, so, so both then, both the home visit and the mentors of the home visitors, you know, the whole, whole intervention was about creating relationships of trust there, which I think are very important. Now, uh, Stephanie mentioned broad patterns. Yes, we do see broad pattern. Uh, well, you know, bro broad with two observations, India and Colombia, uh, but these are quite different cultures. Uh, it, it is very much about shifting parental investments, parental behavior towards the activities that we like them to do. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's related to both the impact, the, the success of the intervention and the fade out of the intervention. And, uh, and it's true in India, it's true in Colombia. Right? So, uh, so, so yes, I think the, the, the stuff we teach or we do are quite fundamental you change the cultural packaging, right? Uh, but you're doing the same thing. In other words, play with the child, talk to the child, uh, uh, so, solve puzzles with the child, right? So they're not, you know, the, the curriculum in some sense is the same. It's culturally adapted, but it's the same, right? Fundamentally from a developmental uh, point of view. So, uh, so yes, there are, now on the sustainability, as I said, the, one of our experiments in India, seem, the effects seem to be uh, upfront larger and sustained in the follow-up. Another experiment in Colombia, uh, we lost the, the impact. Uh, and uh, so, so I think, uh, I think it, it is very important to, to follow up. There's definitely a big impact upfront. Uh, we can improve on that impact. We actually have improving, been improving it as time goes by because we also learn better to do the interventions. And I think, uh, uh, but we, you know we've learned that uh, you know uh, doing things right is uh, you know is extremely important. Here. The devil is really in the in the, in the detail. Uh, yeah, I think I've, um, I've I've covered I've covered the uh, yeah. Excellent. Thanks a lot to all of you. Um, now we have about ten minutes worth of questions from the audience. So I'm going to hand the uh, control over to Nirupama Rao, and she can pass them on to you guys. Terrific. Um, we have some excellent questions from the audience. Um, Mike Mueller-Smith, our colleague here at Michigan, asked about within family spillovers. 
Do you have any evidence as to when you know mothers you know participate in intervention? Does it change their resource allocation within the family? Are they positive spillovers where they're maybe doing some of these things with other children of theirs, or is there sort of a budget concern of some kind where they're reducing um, investments in their other children? Okay, spillovers very important. Uh, why are they important? Because ultimately, what you're uh, trying to uh, affect is cultural change uh, more broadly. First of all, in our in our Odisha, a large experiment we actually collected data on spillovers by, by neighboring families and we find, found none. Within family, we've not, uh, we've not done that because we haven't, you know, basically we haven't had the opportunity to measure children born after our intervention because we took the youngest child. However, I can tell you that we are uh, a group of us, including this time Sally Granlund McGregor and uh, Harold Alderman and, and, and others, uh, we're putting uh, in, we just put in a, an application to, for funding to measure children from a, inter, a very successful inter, you know, uh, intervention in Bangladesh, uh, where they got more than one standard deviation. Uh, they and I was involved in that uh, uh, improvement. So now we're going to go back and measure outcomes for children born after that. And so sufficient time has gone through, so we will be able to see that. That's of course a very important question, but it's a very difficult question. Uh, and uh, when you are in the business of raising funding for these uh, interventions, everyone's very excited. But when it comes down out to dishing out the, the cash, it's always, uh, always quite, quite hard because they are not that cheap to, to run. Of course. Um, Elise Rotella has a question about father's attitudes. So do we see a difference in participation of the mother and child in these programs, depending on the father's attitude? Like perhaps a father is more comfortable with someone coming to their home versus having um, the mother and child leave the home and go somewhere. Do you see some kind of cultural aspect? Maybe this relates to Stephanie's point as well. Yeah. Um, let me, I, unfortunately, we haven't measured that. I'll just give you an anecdote in a field visit in Colombia. Uh, we, uh, we arrived, myself, as the, as, as, as the, the, uh, the guy from the, the Western country, whatever, uh, the, the home visitor, the, the person from the NGO, we arrived with the family, all the niceties of the hellos were said. And then when the intervention started, the father took me out of the, of the house and we both left uh, because it, this was the mother's job. Now, <laughs> one, one observation and, and in Colombia, uh, but my, my, my fear is that it's a, a more generalized thing. Now, I, I know that people have been thinking of uh, ways of involving fathers or, or, well, the question was about measuring it. We haven't, we haven't, uh, uh, in, in India, I, there are other anecdotes where I saw fathers being very excited about, uh, about the intervention, but not but observing it, not, not seeing it. They don't, they don't seem to impede it. Uh, they were very welcome everywhere we go. It's considered a good thing, uh, but whether we change the attitudes fundamentally, I don't know. But that's a good question. And Charlie, sorry, Charlie Brown, our colleague at Michigan, has um, a question about monitoring. You know, he brings up the fact that in other studies, people have found that it's quite hard to get teachers in, in India specifically to show up to their jobs sometimes. And so he's wondering about monitoring of the teachers and the monitors. And, you know, what information do you have about job performance? How many appointments do they actually attend? Do you have to fire people? And are there ways to incentivize them? to you know, perform well um, so that the intervention is actually happening. So that's the role of the mentors. Mm -hmm. So, so each, each mentor is responsible, I can't remember, about five villages or six villages, or ten, five to 10 villages, something like that. And they, they, they go every week and they, they, uh, they monitor. You know, we call them mentors because, we try, you know, because they also support the home visitors. And they help them solve problems. They go to families and try and convince them to, to participate, things like that. But they also collect data on, on, uh, on implementation to the extent, you know, they go to, to visits and they, and sometimes they go behind the back of the home visitors and they ask the families if the home visitor has actually been going. And usually it's fine. There are again some cases where we found out that, you know, the home visitor never went. She invented everything. Uh, and uh, so, 
uh, at that point, we, you know, we did have to, uh, to, 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 to change home visitor there, but, uh, but that was very rare, right? So but that's exactly the role of them. You know, that's why we think the mentors are very important because they, they provide both monitoring and, uh, and support and they actually train the home visitor because we want to do it scalable. We train the mentors, the mentors go and train the home visitors. And um, Jim Hines, our colleague, has another question about um, sort of, you know, the effects we measure are related to very low income families. Do you believe that there's like a level of resources at which these potential benefits of these interventions start to plateau? Um, Asher was asking about this earlier, you know, in the US and in other countries, we see a tilt towards universal policies rather than targeted preschool programs, et cetera. How do you feel about those policy interventions relative to the evidence? And do you think these returns start to plateau? That's, that's a very good question. At the moment, I'm involved in uh, setting up a universal Head Start type program in, in Greece. I'm designing it. Wow. And, uh, and that, 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 that kind of question is, is central, right? You know, of course, when I talk to Sally, uh, who is uh, my mentor on this, uh, on this thing, you know, every, every time I have a question, I just go to her. You know, she's always quite doubtful that these things are, are going to help middle class kids much. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, you know, you know, uh, e e even mentors may not know everything, uh, and it might be that uh, we just have to, we just have to redesign our intervention to uh, to be to, to be better in tune with the uh, with, with the level of the child. You know? So of course, if you do uh, one one uh, one size fits all kind of intervention, then you're going to have kids that are far advanced of, of what you're actually doing. But that doesn't mean you can't help these kids, right? You know, uh, after all, that's why we we uh, we're supposedly selecting uh, the best of the best of the best universities, presumably because we think there's a complementarity there. So why not a complementarity much earlier on? And as our final closing question, a question that Ash raised, um, we know, you know from other studies that language in particular is very hard to improve later on in adolescence with interventions and, and teaching techniques. Do you think what you found in these experiments bolsters the idea that if we establish, you know, language proficiency or cognitive skills very early, that good teaching has higher returns later on? I, 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 personally, I'm sure that's true. And, and that's why, you know, if I'm thinking of the whole policy image rather than just one research paper, I think that uh, a chain of interventions that deals with human capital formation particularly in deprived areas, is, is, is extremely important. I don't think the question is only about language, it's about all domains of development to the extent that you can classify them, right? But I, I do think there's a very strong complementarity. In other words, what we discussed before is not just about sustaining the early impacts, but actually building on them. And, uh, you know, I think the, the policy agenda uh, should be, okay, so, uh, we, we, you know, we, we started at pregnancy, you have to deal with nutrition. When the child is born, you have to deal with human capital formation in a, in a, in a, in a strong and sensitive way, uh, and, you have to, and you have to continue. Uh, and only if, you know, if, you, if, you, if the kids arrive with these massive deficits in school, you, know, you can fund as, as much as you like at school. You're just not going to reverse that uh, very easily. So you know, th these early years are, are of fundamental importance. And understanding what matters there and how it matters is, uh, you know, I think should be a research priority. Thank you very much, uh, Costas, and thank you also to Richard and Stephanie. That was a, a fascinating session, and we certainly learned a lot, and it's, it's a very topical question, not just in uh, Colombia and India, et cetera, but uh, here at home uh, in the United States as well. Um, so we'll close up for today, and tomorrow we have Stephanie presenting uh, with uh, Richard and Costas uh, discussing. So thank you very much. And it'll be the same link tomorrow as well. Great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye.